from around 1050 BC to 850 BC, we have Nubia, Kush, redeveloping itself, newly freed from colonization of Egypt by 850 BC, there is a dynasty of kings that arise around the fourth cataract at Napata. Those kings over the next hundred years will become powerful enough to move into Egypt and actually rule Egypt. So this second Kushite state headquartered at Napata becomes the 25th dynasty of Egypt. These Nubian Kushite kings are named names that are very un-Egyptian. So we have the first who is Pianki. He's followed by Shabaka and Shabitko, Taharka and Tanwatamani. But these are the rulers that brought Egypt back from a period where it was being ruled by several competing chiefdoms in the north. These kings brought back the old ways of Egyptian religion, Egyptian writing, Egyptian customs and art. It was a renaissance of sorts by these Kushite kings. For example, the Napatan kings built pyramids but put their own twist on it. A lot of people think that Kushites copied Egyptians or that they belonged to Egyptian rulers, but that's not true at all. In Sudan, there are actually over 200 pyramids belonging to Kushite royalty. And El Kuru was the first royal cemetery associated with the capital city of Napata. And it contained tombs of the rulers and their ancestors during the 25th dynasty. The earliest burials at El Kuru are tumuli. So again, we see that strong connection to early Nubian culture. Um, and then we see the first pyramid during the reign of Pianki. During the Napatan period, we see the positioning of the body change. So it goes from this flex position where they're laying on their side to now what we consider a more Egyptian-like position of the person laying on their back with their hands on their sides. However, what did not change during this time is the use of burial beds. So they would actually use coffins and place the coffins on top of the burial beds. And so this shows the continuity of funeral practices that date back to early Nubian tradition. Some of the objects that we find buried with the Napatan kings include bows, arrows, quivers, archer thumb rings, and horse harnesses. And that is because Nubians were known for their archery. These items are included in a lot of the royal burials during this time showing, again, strong links to Nubian culture. In addition to reviving ancient Egyptian traditions and customs, the Nubian Kushites also brought some of their own customs into Egypt as well. One of the things that is really distinctive about the Kushites is their veneration of women. So throughout the Kushite period, we have a series of royal women who are doing extraordinary things. We have princesses who are serving as God's wives or priestesses in the temple. We have the queen mother who is instrumental in her son becoming king. And we also, in later periods, in the Meroitic period, we have reigning queens. During the 25th dynasty, we see the introduction of the queen mother. Now, we're accustomed to seeing queen mothers in Egypt. They're the mothers of the king. But in Nubia, she plays a different role. So when a king would ascend to the throne, his mother would be there accompanying him as he's receiving his crowns. On the stele, or the stone tablets that they recorded their coronations on, we would see a, an image at the top of the lunette that would show the king receiving his crown from the god. In addition to the god, there's usually a goddess, but there's always his mother. The king Taharka, in his election stele, talks about the fact that his mother came when he was enthroned 
and that the people lined up and they were cheering for her. So this was an exciting moment for him, but he was even more excited to have his mother come and share that with him. Why was the mother so important? The powerful queen mother was closely associated with the goddess Hathor, or the divine spouse of the supreme god Amun. That goddess's name was Mut. So there's a way in which the women in ancient Nubia served a legitimating function. The king did not become king without his mother by his side. After about 60 to 75 years, the Nubian Kushite rulers were eventually run out of Egypt by invading Assyrians. So thus ended the period of a united Egyptian Kushite state. But the rulers at Napata, the Kushite rulers, and the rulers at Meroe would continue to rule the Kushite state from Nubia for the next thousand years. The third and final phase of the Kushite kingdom was the Meroitic period, which lasted from about 300 BC to 300 AD. It's my favorite period when there was an increased emphasis on indigenous or local traditions. And so they focused their attentions on local Meroitic gods. This was a period of powerful female rulers and during this kingdom, the Kushites developed their own native writing system, the Meroitic script, which we see written in hieroglyphic script and in cursive script, both of which were developed from their Egyptian equivalents. The earliest examples of this writing date from the reign of a king called Arnakamani, who ruled in about 300 BCE. And the majority of the texts that we have are written in the cursive script. They're found written on royal stele, so stone slabs that uh, include written texts. They're found on funerary monuments and in the Nubian prayer inscriptions that I studied. The script has been deciphered, which means that we know what each symbol stands for, but we can only translate about a hundred words at this time. So hopefully if you get inspired by this talk, perhaps you can be the person to crack the Meroitic script. In the Meroitic period, we see the appearance of indigenous gods that were based on uh, locally appearing animals. A lion god called a pedamach or a hippopotamus goddess whose name we unfortunately don't know. Arns Nufus and Sebu Mecker were hunter gods and often depicted as temple door guardians. The hawk god Horus had four distinct Nubian manifestations associated with sites in Lower Nubia, Abu Simbel, Kuban, Buchen, and Aniba. The goddess Amasemi, depicted as a woman who wore a crown formed of the crescent moon and surmounted by a falcon. Elephants were depicted at several temples but were not named as gods. Nubians also adopted the worship of Egyptian gods that likely mirrored their own indigenous gods. Hathor and Isis, both depicted as cow-headed, would have appealed to the Nubian cattle pastoralist. A variant of the Egyptian god Sobek, a crocodile god, appears in late hybrid deities that have a falcon head and a crocodile's body, its tail a rearing cobra. In the Meroitic period, Nubian priests boasted of their astronomical knowledge. The priests that I studied for my dissertation inscribed their prayer inscriptions at Philae. One such prayer said, quote, I am a Wab priest of Sopdet, the Egyptian word for Sirius, who knows the rising and setting of the five visible planets, end quote. 
They use these astronomical events in order to organize their calendar, which let them know the appropriate times to journey to the temples to perform sacred rites for the gods. The rites performed at the temples were often communal. Extended family groups traveled to sacred sites where men served as priests, women performed music and dance, and the entire community celebrated with communal feasts. Back to these female rulers that I was mentioning, five ruled in a row. Amani Reynas, Amani Shaketo, Shana Daketo, Nawidamak, and Amani Tore. This series of five powerful ruling queens held one or both of two different Meroitic titles. The first being Quare, which means ruler, whether male or female, and the second being Kandake, uh, which is translated into English as Candace and, and refers to the queen mother, the woman who births the next eligible ruler. These queens were buried in the pyramids of Meroe, and the pyramids are an outstanding example of Kushite funerary monuments. The Meroitic people adopted the concept of incorporating a pyramid into the design of their royal tombs directly from the Napatan period. Unfortunately, most of the tombs were completely robbed of their original contents in antiquity and later periods. However, some of the objects that we do find consist of amulets, jewelry, glass, bronze, ceramic vessels, cosmetics, because you know you gotta look good even in the afterlife, um, clothes and weapons. We see queens just dripping in gold. So wearing bracelets, many, many rings, necklaces that are also decorated with precious stones such as carnelian or turquoise. The, both king and queen wore their hair short in a, an, an afro and then over that short hair wore a cap crown that was unique, special to the Meroitic rulers. And finally, the queens were all about having a really nice manicure. And so they wore those same long pointy nails that are once again back in style today. Amani Reynas was likely the one-eyed mannish Queen Candace, who was referred to by the Greek historian Strabo in his publication, The Geography. This queen was also referred to in the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. She was the queen who met the Romans in battle when they tried to push south after conquering Egypt. Amanerenas, called Banish, was actually exhibiting this Kushite Nubian aesthetic of a voluptuous woman that was equated both to her attractiveness, but also her power as a ruler. And she led her troops in battle against the Roman where, uh, Romans, where Meroe experienced success and repelled the Roman invasion of the kingdom of Meroe. This level of power attained by these Nubian ruling queens was incredibly rare in the ancient world and is something that is unique to Nubian culture. While this period stands out for its sole ruling queens, it's part of a larger Nubian custom that still survives today. So we can see that despite the cultural interactions and the adoptions of specific cultural practices from the Egyptians, the Nubians in the end maintain a part of their cultural identity independent from Egypt from beginning all the way to the end. <laughs>